legislation. He called the Voting Rights Act of 1965 a humiliation. His stump feet speech featured undeserving criminals who drove fleets of Cadillacs, he claimed, that, per that they purchased with food stamps. He talked about how the poor were destroying the nation, and he won by a landslide. And the South went Republican in percentages so high that it became clear that the Southern strategy had worked overwhelmingly and that it had driven a wedge between the, the, the blacks and whites and others in the South in a way that would destroy the development of progressive fusion people assembly coalitions. And then, if I might rush forward, something happened. You get a guy by the name of Barack Obama to run for presidency from Illinois in 2008. And guess what he does? He runs a campaign rooted in the idea of fusion politics. Like you had in the 1800s. In, like in Virginia, you saw in the 1960s. And guess what? Like Doug Wilder, he wins. And the electorate is broad and it's deep and it's young and it's old and it's LGBT and it's black and it's Hispanic and it's Asian and it's labor and it's people of faith and people struggling with faith. And people who want to push America beyond the vestiges of racism. And this election, the electorate, not President Obama, but the electorate represents the possibility of a third reconstruction. Right in our midst. this time. The demographics are changing. More black and brown people, younger folks are not as bound as they once were by the, by the, by the, the, the divisions of the old white southern strategy. And understanding where we were was why seven years ago, don't, don't think Marl Monday started this year. Seven years ago, we started the Forward Together movement. Historic thousand people on Dungeon Street. We came up with a 14 point agenda. And we understood seven years ago that something was different. We weren't as bound. And we began to work together. And we brought people together of all different races and colors and creeds and sexuality. And we designed a 14-point agenda. And with that 14-point agenda, we were able to win powerful things like same-year registration and early voting, like more money for public education. We were able to push our Southern Senator to support the Affordable Care Act. We were able to, to deal with issues like the death penalty through the Racial Justice Act. And, and so it comes to no surprise then, if you understand the history of reconstruction and deconstruction, that the extremist policies that we're seeing in North Carolina and around the country are an attempt to hold back and suppress this growing coalition of people who are coming together in this third reconstruction. Because the new electorate that elected President Obama, and more importantly has the power to reshape the South, scares the daylight out of those who have a homogeneous view of life. It does not fit their worldview. So what have we seen in the last few years? The same attacks that we saw that ended the first reconstruction and the second reconstruction. The attack on voting rights. The attack on educational rights. The attack on labor rights. The attack on fair uh, tax uh, policy. And the attack on leadership that wants to move in a progressive way. The attack on, did I say labor rights? On labor rights. If you read history, you see the same kinds of attack. It's just old wine. And some of it's not even in a new wine bottle. <laughs> they might, the only thing is they've added now immigration, attacking the immigration rights, attacking the LGBT community, going all out attacking women's rights. Because every time this nation has had a moral reconstruction, you can count on an immoral deconstruction. When Fox News says change, this nation is changing, that's a code word for there's a reconstruction happening. Yeah. That's going to bring us more closer to being a more perfect union. That's going to seriously try to live out what it means to establish justice. And we have to be the new redemption movement, immoral redemption movement, that attempts to stifle this reconstruction. Now, if we understand this history and where we are, then we can be clear about what we must do and the attacks won't surprise us.
Turn your neighbor and say, it's because of our strength and not our weakness that we are seeing these attacks. And if you understand this, then you understand that to change the nation, we have to fix states, especially southern states. And if you're going to change the nation, what you need are state-based, indigenously led, anti-racist, anti-poverty, pro-labor, pro-justice, equality for all, focused on state legislators and governors, deeply moral, deeply constitutional, agenda-based, rooted in the concept of fusion coalition movement. This is the only kind of movement that can beat back the attack. It's not going to come by some national leader following in, doing a helicopter drop in for a speech and leaving. It. It's got to be built up from the ground, up from the people, block by block, county by county. And it's got to focus. You can't focus on everything. You've got to understand that your greatest enemy right now to progressive reconstruction is not so much the United States Congress, it's state capital. It's state capital. Because state capital decide voting rights. State capital decide educational funding. State capital decide whether you are right to work or so-called uh, labor anti-labor union state. State capital. Somebody say state capital. State capital. Now Alec figured this out 20 years ago. And it makes no sense that we don't figure it out today. We must. And you must understand, you're being, we, we are, you'll be attacked because of your power. That's what we understand in North Carolina. We're being attacked because of the work, because of what we want. So what do you do? You fight back in the streets, you fight back in the suites, you fight back on social media, you fight back in the court, you fight back in the pulpits, and in an election year, you fight back at the ballot box. So when I, when I, I'm almost through, when our governor, Republican-led legislator, cut the payroll tax credit for 900,000 people so he could give 23 families a tax break, rejected funding for 500,000 North Carolinians in Medicaid, slash state unemployment benefits, took 170,000 people off unemployment, and then passed the most atrocious voter suppression bill since Jim Crow that's not about voter ID but about voter suppression that not only tries to bring voter ID but tries to, was, was going to end same day registration, end early voting. When they did this, the attacks did not make us run. It made us fight. Because we understand they would not be attacking us if we were weak. The attack is because we are right in the middle of a third reconstruction and people in this room and others around this nation have got to decide are we going to let them turn this reconstruction back or are we going to go forward together? Our protest began in Raleigh. Lean on expanded across the state. Since April 941 Morrow Monday protesters have been arrested. This grew up out of the seven years of organizing. It didn't just happen spontaneously. Because we had worked hard for seven years, working and building coalition. When this attack happened, we were able to fight back. And it's not just civil disobedience, it's social media, it's voter education. We have a legal strategy because it requires all of this. And we don't use the language Republican versus Democrat because that language is too small. We don't even use the language conservative versus liberal. Because sometimes I'm conservative, especially when I use hot salt. <laughs> sometimes I'm liberal, you know. I got a whole take on conservatism, you know. The, the ultra-right religionists say they're the conservatives. But if conservative means to hold on to the essence, and if most of the time what you talk, you're saying more about what God says the least about, and the least about what God says the more about, you're not really a conservative. Hmm? So rather than the labor, we said it's a new land. We need a moral language. We need a language that says, look, this policy is constitutionally inconsistent, morally indefensible, and economically insane. <laughs> and what that language does is it allows people, that's why 16% of the folk marching with Marmot are Republicans. 
That's how I can go up in the mountains of Mitchell County. There's 99, there's 98 percent white and 89 percent Republican, and they send for us and then announce to us when we get up there that the Republican chair has renounced the party and is joining the Moral Monday movement based on the issue. Because even among progressives, we've got to think out of the box. We can't automatically repent. You don't know what people will do when their conscience is awake. You don't know what will happen when people have an epiphany. Somebody said that, that this attack on Medicaid is a direct attack on the poor. That didn't come from a liberal. It didn't come from a pro progressive. It came from the Republican governor of Ohio. You don't know what happens when we dare to give a moral critique. And so that's what's happening now. So we believe, finally, that here are five principles. If we can focus on economic sustainability and ending poverty and labor rights, educational equality, health care for all, fairness in the criminal justice system, and protecting and expanding voting rights, women's rights, immigrant rights, and the rights of LGBT citizens, we ought not have to have five more meetings and ten more votes to agree on that. <laughs> if, if, if progressives and Democrats and those of you that fought the war, the battles of yesteryear, and those of us that want to fight the battle of death, can't agree on that without having 57 sessions, <laughs> that tells the folk in North Carolina they want to keep meeting while the legislature was killing us. You, there comes a time that you can't engage in the paralysis of analysis. Yes. There's some stuff we ought to know already. We took those five issues and said that somebody must stand. And it doesn't matter what part is in power. I heard y'all had some, some success up here recently with the election. But let me tell you, our fight in North Carolina didn't start when there was a Republican majority. We had to fight Democrats to get same-day registration. We had to fight Democrats to deal with the death penalty. We had to push Democrat to support the Affordable Care Act. And the truth of the matter is, if North Carolina is three to one Democrats, the supermajority of Republicans we have now is because some Democrats didn't vote Democrat. So a moral agenda says we're going to hold everybody accountable. Oh, I didn't get too many amens right there. Huh? Yeah. Somebody has to say, there are some things that must be challenged because they're wrong, they're extreme, and they're immoral. It's extreme for, and immoral for any state, especially a southern state, to make it harder for people to vote. It's extreme and immoral and insane to cut Medicaid to the poor. It's extreme and immoral to raise taxes on the poor. It's extreme and immoral to cut unemployment benefits. It's extreme and immoral and economically insane to dismantle public schools and put our schools in the hands of private companies. It's extreme, it's immoral, it's insane to hurt our immigrant brothers and sisters who every day build this country. It's extreme, it's immoral. It's insane not to pay people a living wage while we continue to give free money to Wall Street. It's extreme, it's immoral, it's wrong to hurt people because of their sexuality. When the Bible says, from one blood, God has made all people. Oh, we must raise our moral descent. Because it's our calling to do. If Virginia is for lovers, <laughs> then there's got to be some folk in Virginia, not somebody coming from outside of Virginia, but there's got to be some folk in Virginia that ask the Democrats, the Republican, the governor, and the legislature, who does your education policy say you love? If Virginia is for lovers, who does your tax policy say you love? What, who does your budget say you love? Who does your immigrant policy say you love? Who, do, who when, you, when you vote on women's issues, who does it say you love? We're no longer going to allow you to get away with slogans while you're hurting people. We're going to examine your policy with a deep moral critique. And dissenters destroy the myth of delusion and domination. And I'm so glad to be a part of a generation of moral dissenters. 
Are there any of you in here? Is there anybody?